This is 40K Today, the 40K podcast so important that we had our psychic awakening ages ago. We've been psychically awake since, like, second edition. Hello, and welcome to a special Best of 40K Today. Monday to Friday, we are your daily 15-minute news, views, and interviews deep dive into the entire hobby of Warhammer 40,000. Today, we bring you a selection of our favorite interviews from the week. We have to say a massive thanks to our friends at Frontline Gaming for having us in on a Saturday. If you like what, a, what you hear, give us a listen during the week at 40kdave.com, or you can find us via your favorite podcast player. Just search for 40K Today. I'm your host with the most, John Damaris, and today on the program, we talk to an eight-year-old girl who loves the hobby. Tanya Gates talks about starting a new army. Mark Perry gives us a great coaching tip. And finally, Eric Festa gives us a wonderful tip for using contrast paints. Tanya just got to have the cutest conversation ever with Ava, who's eight, and her dad. They tell us how Ava got started in miniature gaming, and Ava shares some of her experiences. Thank you so much for coming onto the program, Ava. You're welcome. Okay, so I know that you play Age of Sigmar with your dad. What do you enjoy most about playing the game? I like playing the bosses because they're more powerful, and usually I beat my dad at all of them. I love it. So what models have you painted, and do you have a favorite one? I've painted more than three, but I've picked out three that I like. I like the Dark Oath War Chief, the Ishran Tidecaster, the Stormcast Eternal Celestial, and the Vindicator, and I actually won a competition for the Young Blood Best Painted for that one. Ah, what do you like most about those models? What makes them your favorite? Well, because the first one I followed along with a tutorial, and the second one I just used bright colors for all of them, and the third one I I really like it because I put snow on it, and then it's got lots of detail. I love it. So would you recommend the game for any other girls your age? Yeah, because you don't just get to paint. You get to play a game as well. It's like you can get like a board and you could draw anything you wanted and just play without even painting it if you wanted. So there's a lot of freedom in the game to do a lot of different things? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff you can do. Like you have lots of different characters and there's a boss in each one and all of the bosses have the most power. It's like you've got an advantage on it. Yeah. I actually love playing Age of Sigmar, but this podcast is about playing Warhammer 40k. Do you ever think that you might give Warhammer a try? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Thank you so much, Ava. You're welcome. So, Rob, how did you start playing the game of Age of Sigmar with your daughter? Did that happen naturally, or did that take some, uh, like, coaxing? Yeah, it wasn't really coaxing. It was more of a natural, she would take an interest in what I was doing. And once she started to kind of become more and more interested in the painting side of things, I think the natural progression for her was, what does daddy do when he goes down the store with his friends? He normally plays a game. I want to play a game. So what we started to do was make a very uh, stripped back version of AOS, whereas you had movement, you had your attacks and things like this, but you didn't have battle shock. Um, it's kind of not quite balanced, um, but it really, really worked, I think, to interest her and to show her that different models did really different things. And as she kind of liked it, I think because she she won, and I think currently she's beat me about six times. Eight times. Oh, about eight times to my measly two wins, I think. Um, you kind of do get that little bit of thirst for it, and then you want to try a little bit more. And I think that's where she's she's kind of at the stage now. And I think the last thing we we did was we ran a, it was Ogre versus Maggotkin in our local game store. We booked out the table to ourselves and we actually played two games back to back, uh, taking turns to be the different armies. And 
I think I won one and you won one. Yeah. Yeah. So it was it was a draw, but you know, for a for an eight year old girl to kind of grasp everything does something different and to play to an advantage and you know, it was a, a really good learning curve for her to kind of start small. And it's something that I've often said I wish um they did almost like a, a junior version of Warhammer because as a parent it would save me a hell of a lot of time explaining these rules if you just had a product that was kind of box ready, which I think would be a you know a really good entry point for especially people Ava's age um, to kind of get started in a hobby. That's actually a really great idea. Um, do you have any advice for any other dads who might want to introduce the game to their daughters? Yeah, I guess Warhammer can be a very niche thing. Let them show the interest. I think with most things, when you try and kind of force it upon people sometimes, it can be that it's when you get that rebellious streak in in kids, is let them take an interest and let them ask. Um, I've never once forced or suggested, I always wait for my kids to kind of ask, Dad, let's do some painting. Dad, can we play a game? Um, because I think that's a better way of it shows their curiosity is peaked as opposed to you're saying, hey, come look at this. Sometimes kids can be very uh, fickle and they have to be in the mood for things. Um, not all kids are the same, but I know my two are very fickle when it comes to stuff like this. If they don't want to do something, they're not going to do it. And no amount of me uh, trying to appeal to them is is not going to go anywhere. Um, so I think it's. Uh, yeah, let them show an interest. And if they don't, they don't. If they do, you know, then it's that's when you nurture it and you try and help it grow and you um you try and encourage them to to do it. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on the program, guys. I was so happy to have you here. Well, thank you very much for having us. I might just die of cuteness overload. How awesome was that interview? Are you getting ready to start a new army for ninth edition? Want some friendly advice for how to approach the project without pulling all of your hair out? You're in luck as I interview the War Mistress herself about this very thing. Tanya, thanks so much for giving us some time to give us a hobby tip this week. I don't know if people know you as our social media guru and interviewing superstar, but most of them, or a lot of them probably know this, but you're actually a very accomplished um, painter and do a lot on Instagram and have a pretty large following. So I thought we would get some hobby tips especially around the idea that there's a lot of new players that are coming into the game and getting an army painted can be a little intimidating. Do you have some tips that you could break down? Maybe your top three things for them to think about as they sort of make their plan? For sure. So the first thing that I like to do when I'm starting a new army, because I will be starting a new army. So I'm starting this part first is I like to have a vague idea of the color scheme that I'm going to be going for. So I got an amazing pink paint um, that I really love. And that's going to be like my main sort of accent color. That's going to be like the standout piece. And then um, once I have that sort of like showstopper piece, then I like to pick out like a neutral tone that kind of complements it. So I'm, I'm going to be painting Necrons, obviously. So um, I have my amazing pink, and I think that it's going to look really great with Warp Block Bronze, which is a Citadel color. Um, and then after that, which is a metallic as well, um, and then from there, I will play around with it, and it'll go into my next step, which is to do a entire unit of troops. Um, I like to play around with troops because, in general, you're going to need lots of them, and they're probably going to die really fast. So if they don't look great, it doesn't really matter. You're not painting a mod like a, a HQ unit first, something that's more expensive. Um, it's going to be on the table longer. So that first unit of troops is like my play unit. It's it's um, where I can experiment a little bit. I take those first ideas that I'm building now. And then um, I can add in, you know, my shades, any other sort of uh, accenting or highlighting colors, and I can really solidify what I'm going to do in that unit. That sounds amazing. So basically, you are 
starting with your favorite color, I would say, right? And then picking something that will accentuate that. Yep. And then starting with a unit, right? Um, and then using that to sort of build up from there. And then kind of you can make decisions based on how things are going or or what you how you think it looks and um, sort of experiment. Because like you said, if you screw up on a, a trooper model, you don't really care. <laughs> it doesn't really where matter. where that came from. Yep. Yeah. More meat for the meat grinder? Is that how that works? Exactly. And then um, from there, once I have my color scheme solidified in that one troop unit, and I'm like, yeah, that looks awesome. I know exactly where I'm going to go from here. Then I base coat and wash the entire army. Now, there's two reasons why I do this. This makes it technically tabletop ready so that I can go to events with it. I can take it down to the game store, and it's not gray plastic. It's it's good enough to get on the, the tabletop and I feel awesome about it. And then once that's all done, then I can slowly pick away at it, add highlights, bring it up to above tabletop standard. Oh, so you take, and you sort of like, let's just say, for example, you planned out a 2000 point list for your sort of starter army. Yep. Um, you would, like we talked about before, pick out your plan for your colors and then you would paint it all just as a base coat, a wash, right? Yep. And, and that's it. And then just do your basing, and then uh, you would go back and do highlighting as you had time, but then you would have this army to play with, and you could just improve it, right, um, exactly. as you went along. Okay. Exactly. That's really smart. Yeah, because, you know, I do like to go, I, I play a lot at the game store when it, it reopens, and uh, I, I do the odd tournament here and there, so it means that I don't have to stress out so much about painting everything in, like, the two weeks between tournaments or whatever, I can just sort of take my time and really make my models look great. Right. And then once you have that, whatever, wherever your starting point is, some people will start with 500 points. Some people will start with a tournament competitive army, right? At 2000 points, then you just add things piecemeal that you like, right? And you're like, Oh, I want to, I want to play this particular model. Maybe it's a new tank or, you know, a monolith <laughs> or something like that. Exactly. Uh, and so you can paint that in and sort of, um, not make it into a big deal. And then as your painting skill improves, you can go back over models and do better highlights, um, pick out more detail, uh, you know, give it some special flourishes. And, you know, especially if it's like a character model or something and you really want it to pop, well, then you can, you can take that time and, and just continue to like make a showpiece for your, for your army. I think that's really cool. Exactly. And the benefit of doing it this way too, is like you said, as you play test your list and you find holes in it, or it's lacking something that you want, it's really easy just to add in a unit or two as you go. And then again, just base coat and wash it, get on the table, try it out, and then add it to the queue of things you want to just highlight as you go. That's awesome. Well, thanks, Tanya. I think that's really, really good advice. And hopefully that'll give everybody a plan for getting their models painted so they get those 10, 10 painting points, right? Oh, yeah. This podcast is a little dangerous. I may end up with many, many, many armies with how easy she makes this sound. Welcome back. Mark Perry, the beast from the Southeast, swings by to tell us a great coaching tip for getting ready for 9th edition. He has his own brand of jank and a different way of looking at the game, and that comes across in this interview very well. Mark Perry, the beast of the Southeast, joining us on 40K Today. Tell me a little bit about getting better in ninth edition. Uh, obviously, you're an Art of War coach and have been doing a ton with chaos. So what kind of advice do you have for our listeners out there? Hey, John, thanks for having me on. And something about chaos is anytime you're building a chaos list from the beginning, is you got to have a flexible mind. And this is like anytime you're building something that's a new list. Is there's all kinds of possibilities. And you just kind of have to look at a list from a fundamental level, like, this is what I'm going to do with this list. Here's all the units I want to take. I'll buff them up in these ways. Even if they may be considered bad tier units or just units that you don't use often are considered, you know, you, you would have to look at them in a different light. Something with chaos, I would always say, is to experiment and to try something out and use it with a fresh ideas. So Very cool. That's something I, that's, that's what I believe deep down inside of my heart. And that's how I play the game when it comes to chaos. Okay, so then would you say that in general you would encourage people when you say a flexible mind mm -hmm. uh, to be thinking about how to use a lot of different units, I guess, um, at, that uh, uh, 
that you normally would not use because there's in at least in chaos and actually this works across all of 40k right there's a lot of uh, sometimes synergies where the sum is greater than the parts correct so that's one of the things where it comes down to you have to have a, understand what that unit's job and goal is uh, and what it is for that matchup or however the game is or how your strategy is built around your list. And that's something you sit there and say, here's one thing that does this. Here's another thing that does a similar thing, but little differences. And that's where you have to ask yourself, hey, look, in the situation I'm going to be most of the time in, which one's better? And then okay. you have to also understand that your opponent may not understand what is sometimes those best situations. Um, and that's where your job is playing in there. An example is coming up this week, I'm going to be bringing emulators and then for children's list. But I'm not bringing emulators as like because they're one of the worst units in the game. I'm not bringing it as a hard hitting counter assault or like going to go in there and just kill my opponent. I'm bringing it as for screens because they're very cheap going in the ninth edition, and they're very like compared for dur- durability, they're actually pretty durable points per wounds. And the honor of the prince allows them to do those couple of different plays with this faction. That's like this unit that's considered very subpar. It's probably one of the worst ones in the game. But the, all the roles that I want to do with it, I'm finding success with. Okay. So you would say that that you think that um, flexibility and trying lots of different things in your army to figure out what works for you is probably the way to go. And then you use that uh, to sort of inform your decisions as you, as you start honing in on what works. So um, maybe for ninth edition, would you would you describe it as throwing you know, jello on the wall and see what sticks, that kind of thing? A little bit like that. I also sit there and sit there, like I there's a play style in every single person. And to understand what they want to do as a player, find those units that, hey, look, here's my game strategy. And in the addition, this may still be my green strategy. Am I a combo player? Am I an aggressive player? Am I a passive? Am I very defensive? Uh, finding those units that do to your personal strategy, to your style, and to play to show off your strengths is what I find is very important. Okay. That's really cool. Um, let me ask you, what's your impression of ninth edition? Like, what do you think is going to be good? Where do you think there's room to grow? Like, how is it going to be different than say, uh, eighth edition? So I think comparing ninth to eighth is almost like comparing like fifth and six, possibly a little bit to eight where in this game, I feel like it's going to be very much more tactical not so much strategical where sometimes you just win games because of the matchup and you have a full out there where this one, there's a lot more smaller engagements and a lot more less the units where the game feels a little bit more squad based and placing those little units tactically best is one of the stronger things, how to win the game. Also very tough obsec fighting on objectives is where the ninth edition I'm really enjoying because it makes so many interesting positioning uh, plays very, very fun to me, but also very interesting for just how could I have done this better? How could he have done this better? How does my list focus on these objectives? Say, I'm going to fight these objectives. I want to keep these objectives. And they're causing these really good battles because how important it is to control the objectives and how in your face, you and your opponent have to have the, to a certain degree, to win the game. Yeah, because, you know, I, you tell me if I'm wrong, but like this sit back and pound your army, their, their army with artillery. You'll just lose on primary. If you lose on primary. You you may sometimes have some terms where if someone just runs onto you, you'll get five or zero points on it, and you just can't afford that. Yeah, no, it's it's really tough because you only get four scoring turns. So let's Correct. right because um, you don't score on turn one, and there's only five turns in the game. Yep. And since yeah. you only you only score uh, for four turns, if you take two turns off of not scoring, like you get so far behind, like you have to be participating in the game. Absolutely. Which is, that's one of the things I always think is really good is the fact that you don't score the objectives during your turn, you score them during your next turn. So you're always being forced to sink a step ahead. Yeah, actually I hadn't really thought about that, but I suppose that's a really good tip too. You're going to have to be sort of not necessarily planning for this turn, which is always important, but also planning for what's going to happen during your opponent's turn because you, you need to be able to predict where your guys are going to survive and where they're going to die. Yeah. Um, because y- you have to set up to score those, those primary points. Exactly, bro. Very cool. All right. Well, thanks for the tips, Mark. We really appreciate it. And, uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye. So much excitement for ninth edition. Were you disappointed with con- that contrast paints were not actually skill in a bottle? Yeah, me too, but don't despair. 
Eric Felsley gives us some great tips for using them to do really cool effects on your models. Eric, welcome back to the show. Today, we're here to give the listeners a great hobby tip. What do you have on your radar? Hey, John. Thanks for having me back. Um, so I want to talk about something a little controversial in the hobby, uh, hobby world today, and that's contrast paints. So I know a lot of people gave contrast paints a bad rap when they came out the door. And I do agree that they don't work out of the box uh, like GW actually um, promotes. But uh, I have found that when you cut them with the contrast medium, uh, specifically the medium, I, I don't use the water. It's mostly the medium. You can actually get some really, really amazing effects. Okay, well, that sounds like a really good tip. So let's talk about that. Why don't we talk about one of the, your favorite ways to use that and what sort of effect you can get by, and how much, I guess, also the step-by-step, -step, like how much do you have to cut with sure. the, uh, the medium, yeah. Sure, so so one thing you'll notice, uh, or people will notice when they're working with the contrast paints is that some are much more pigmented than others. Um, a lot of the darker colors, like Black Templar, uh, Shaiish Purple, uh, even Warp Stone Lightning, these, these colors have a lot of pigment in them. And so when you don't cut them, they coffee stain very heavily, or they leave stains on uh, higher surfaces. So what I really like to do with these is, is I kind of group them into different categories in my mind, and I'll cut them either one to five or one to 10 with contrast medium, and then use them almost like washes. Um, but I find they give you a way better gradient for a lot less work. And uh, one, of the, one of the effects that I really, really love to do with this is glow effects. So I, I start by painting Corax white onto whatever I want to glow. And then I will take, uh, let's just talk about, uh, let's talk about greens since we have Necrons coming out soon. So uh, what I'll do is I'll cut warp contrast lightning one to 10. So that means 10 parts medium to one part paint? Correct. Yep. And you okay. can either, I split my stuff into dropper bottles. I've actually ordered dropper bottles off of Amazon and transferred everything over, but you can easily do it by just taking brushfuls. Uh, if you ever watch Duncan Rhodes or any of the GW painting service tips, they'll show you how to do that with a paintbrush. It's actually not too hard. And then you literally just paint that over the white and let it dry. Uh, and you'll notice right away you have a pretty decent glow effect. And then if you, you can go back with uh, some of the color undiluted and just put it around the edges and you get a really good poor man's glow. Um, I have a couple examples of this on my uh, Instagram. You can see I do lenses this way. I do plasma coils this way. Um, I have some tutorials for that that you can actually see it in effect. Cool. Yeah, well, send me a link, and we'll definitely put that in the show notes so people can sort of check this out. So that's pretty awesome for doing glow effects. Can you give me another way that you might use the contrast paint? So I guess my question specifically yeah. is, if you cut them in the right way, can you use them more towards the promise of contra contrast paints, which is the one coat um, sort of, shade and highlighting at the same time yeah so it's a it does uh you do have to put a base coat color down of what you want and the difference between a wash and the contrast is the contrast will actually slightly tint whatever your base color is while highlighting it at the same time and and shading it so you get um a much smoother translation and much more vibrant colors so uh i have a Example, uh, once again, point back to my little tutorials. I have one on dark leather that I just put up the other day. And you can actually see the effect it has when you take uh, Basilicanum Gray, which is um, one of the more popular contrast paints. It's a little on the thinner side. You don't have to cut it. And you can put it right over Dryad Bark, and you get a really nice-looking dark leather that you can then hi highlight up. Oh, so I see. So you're saying that contrast paints, because, because they, they sort of... Um tint the colors you can use them to go over other colors and create lots of interesting effects with depth correct and, right so you're saying they're really they're maybe not a great tool for base coating your models but they are a great tool for blending them together and making them i guess look a lot smoother and cleaner yes and, and some of them you can use out of the bottle like gw advertises but it's uh you got to kind of experiment with them um i i have a couple that I go to regularly that I use, and I, I've pretty much made a lot of tutorials about them already. So you can you can check those out firsthand. Well, that's amazing. Um, <laughs> I'm actually might have to try contrast paints. I, I, I'm telling you, uh, Eric, I can't paint. I have no <laughs> talent for it at all. So I, really I have seen your old men off. <laughs> oh yeah, you did see those things. Huh? They look like somebody ate them and then passed them. So that was. Uh, 
it was a, it was a fair attempt, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Listen, I will never fault anyone for putting paint on their minis. I, you know, I, I'm all for that. Well, I mean, honestly, we all we all have to get better about that to get our ten points, right? Oh, so, the ten points, yes, the, the controversial ten points. <laughs> the controversial ten points. Uh, I'll be honest. Back in you know, because we met playing War Machine and Hordes, right? Yeah. And back yeah. in the day, painting requirements I used to think were dumb. I would just yeah. was like, I don't know, this is dumb. But now that I've gotten a little older and a little wiser and a little less like focused on winning games and more focused on enjoying the hobby. Like I actually think painting requirements are a really cool thing and really beneficial. What's your take real quick before I let you go? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, obviously I love to paint and I love to teach people how to paint. So I am all for those 10 points. Uh, it's funny cause my gaming partner actually doesn't like the idea. Um, but, but I've been doing some tutorials to try and help get his army off the ground for ninth edition. Um, but yeah, you know, we, I used to love just hanging out with my friends and painting and it was another way, um, you know, that you could socialize around the game. It wasn't, you know, it doesn't have to talk tactics. You don't have to talk, you could just sit and paint and teach people or learn things from other people and talk about the fluff or talk about good stories about the games, things like that. So I think that's something that's fallen off recently with the advent of, you know, the internet and you get people hang out uh, in person as much anymore. Uh, <laughs> and COVID. <laughs> and co- of course, I mean, obviously yeah. the 10,000 pound virus in the room, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. but uh, I think that's something that once this kind of lifts, um, we can get back to. All right. Well, thank you for your time. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me again. Check out his tutorials for more great, great ways and uh, painting your models. It is that special time of the show. It's the the model of the day. The the model of the day. The the model of the day. Every day during our regular weekday show, we feature a model of the day, and we've been able to show off some stunning work this week. This week's model of the week is one you might have already seen. This beautiful Necron Wraith by Daughter of Cain has been painted with an oxidized finish reminiscent of gasoline on water. The glowing green orbs contrast masterfully against the warm orange of the glow effects. The model has a scenic face with lava effects which are reflected in source lighting throughout the model. And crisp highlights complete this master for work. You have it. This Wraith must be seen to be believed. It is amazing. Now, if you have a model that you think we should feature on the show, or you've seen a model that should be featured on the show, let us know with our hashtag on Instagram, hashtag 40 gay today, or toss us a message on Facebook. And that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us. A big thanks to our content producer, Alex Boehner, our social media superstar, Tanya Gates, and our technical producer, Seamus Ronan, for all their hard work once again in putting this program together. If you liked what you heard on the show today, make sure you come check us out at 40ktoday.com or on your favorite podcast platform. We do a 15-minute show every day with just the kind of information that was found in today's show. We'll see you next week. Until then, for Steve Joel and Paul Murphy, I'm John Damaris, and that's what's happening in 40K Today. 